anybody that has ever gone against us or anybody that would ever step in front of us will be taken care of. We'll be taken care of. Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. In all my years, I have never seen anything like this before. In 1969, a young film crew was allowed inside the most notorious cult of the 20th century. Called The Family, it's led by 34-year-old ex-con Charles Manson. The truth has not been in your courtroom. Uh, it's, a, it's all a play, isn't it? They film the family as they live, love, and talk of being groomed to kill. He's telling you the kill is all right. The death is just the most beautiful trip in the world. Much of the footage has never been seen. Scene one, take one. He would never show it out fun, but he was, he was the devil. It was rediscovered in 2017, allowing former cult members to see themselves as they once were. Did you ever think of uh, Cheryl Tate's baby? I didn't know her. Anybody watching this would think I was a monster. And we can see from the inside how Manson brainwashed his followers. He wouldn't have had to do anything, and I would have done what he wanted. Revolution is on. And why? Whatever people have been asking for, we'll give it to him. We'll give it to him. What is your name? My name is Ronnie Howard. I, uh, I got to be friends with uh, Susan Atkins, the one who killed Sharon Tate. And she told me the whole story about everyone that was involved, details and everything. Charlie who? Charles Manson. <laughs> He's a product of our society. You can't prove anything that happened yesterday. I said, uh, who really killed Sharon Tate? And she said, I did. Before Osama bin Laden, Charles Manson was the boogeyman in chief. You can't prove anything. She just kept stabbing her until she stopped screaming. There's nothing to prove. It's much control to the point to where they couldn't leave if they wanted to. Charlie loves us. Now is the only thing that's real. Is Charlie guilty? Every man judges himself. Charlie loves judges us. Himself. Some people are making a movie. You know what you are, as I know what I am. Nobody can stand in judgment. The boogeyman in chief. You can't prove anything. He robbed us Nobody from can our stand parents. in judgment. This is why these young girls attach themselves to Manson. And he gave us back to ourselves. It's spring 1969. Young Americans are rebelling against inequality, against racial oppression, against the way their parents did things. On a rundown ranch outside Los Angeles lives a twisted version of this hippie ideal. Instead of following their free will, they follow their leader, Charles Manson. Manson has become obsessed with one extraordinary idea. Tell me about Charlie's master plan. His master plan was to start a revolution in which the blacks would fight against the whites and everyone would fight against everybody else and that everyone would get killed except for Charlie and a few blacks would be left to be their servants. He'd heard about this, in my understanding, from his time in jail and reform school that the black man had been talking about. They were gonna rise up over the white man. And they were, there was gonna be this, you know, apocalyptic race war. Talk about the revolution. Well, it's here. It's, uh... The revolution is waiting for a spark. Everybody's ready. Everybody's got their their guns together. Most people do, and anybody who doesn't should. And um, 
Everybody's waiting for a spark. Everybody's waiting for somebody to have enough love to start it. And Charlie has all the fear. Everybody has given their fear to Charlie. There are rumors around that this is... Manson believes he is getting instructions about starting the coming revolution from a most unlikely source. You guessed it, the Beatles. The Beatles' White Album is released in November 1968. Charlie played it forwards and backwards, and he played it over and over again. He really thought that this was a message to him, you know, about this coming race war. There were lots of songs in there that all confirmed what Charlie had been saying or what we were doing as a family. The first song of significance is the song Blackbirds. Well, the Blackbirds were the black men, and they'd been waiting to arise. There was another song in the album called Piggies, and pigs to the Manson family were not cops. They were white, upper middle class and upper class uh, people. There was a song about people who were at the bottom of the slide of society getting back uh, to the top. And according to Manson, these were the blacks. Manson took the title of that song, Helter Skelter, and gave that uh, name to the revolution. It was crazy, crazy thinking. Manson's family are no longer just followers. He sees them as an army preparing for war. He issued us all buck knives and showed us how to use them in the most effective way to kill someone. He taught us to, to hold a knife so it was like part of our fist, and that's how you do it with a shiv in prison. I thought of it all as a, a way to protect myself. He taught the girls differently than he taught the guys. So I think when I remember learning, it was with the girls. So he taught us where the vulnerable places in a man was. The reason being that you would hit as many organs, you know, vital organs as possible. I think it was the juggler and the genitals. I didn't think about it, and I don't remember him really making me think that we were the ones that were going to be doing the killing. We're always ready. The new thought is to be a strong reflection of the father. Now, I'm just finding out about this, see? And it feels good. It feels good to know. The final piece of Manson's preparation is a test of skill and nerve, what he calls creepy crawlies. We were always trained to sneak around, yeah. Charlie would send the girls out, and I think, I think some of the guys went too, but mostly the girls, he would send them out on these creepy crawly missions. Creepy crawlies, oh, we used to sneak all around, yeah. Whenever a car comes by, you're near a highway, you just stay still. You just sneak around. No one can sneak around. They would dress in black, and at night they would go into other people's homes, not necessarily to steal anything, but it was mostly just to, you know, like instill, I think, fear, just mess with people's minds, rearrange the furniture, eat some of the food, leave some of the food out. It was kind of like a practice run to see if you could sneak in unnoticed. By July 1969, Manson has weaponized his cult and has complete power over them. Power enough to make some kill. Circumstances provide an opportunity to put that power to the test. How was the body discovered? He was found in the living room 
directly up here and uh, he was lying on his back with multiple stab wounds. He had been dead approximately one week at the time that he was found. I'm Bobby Bosselet. I am in prison in California. I was convicted of the murder of Gary Hinman uh, in 1970. Uh, it's hard for me to talk about it even, even after all these years. The family have bought some drugs from Gary Hinman. They think the drugs are bad. Manson and family associate Bobby Beausoleil pay Hinman a visit. I did rub Gary up a little bit first. I thought he would still have money. He didn't. I believed him. I didn't have any reason not to believe him. Manson is not so forgiving. He cuts Hinman across the face with a sword. I shot him away and slashed Gary's face. And he said, to show you how to be a man. His exact words, I'll never forget that. What I've wished a thousand times is that I had taken Gary to the emergency room. Instead, I killed him. I stabbed Gary twice in the chest. Paying for that ever since, and I've been regretting it ever since. He was a good man, Gary. Gary was a decent, kind human being, and he did not deserve what I did. Hinman's murder is proof to Manson that his family are ready to start Helter Skelter. He's got your soul in his sight. It's a full moon out tonight. You won't see the morning light. Less than two weeks later, on the evening of August 8th, 1969, Charles Manson selects his most trusted followers for a creepy crawly mission like no other. Charles Tex Watson, 23-year-old, ex-high school football star. Patricia Krenwinkel, 21, a one-time church choir member. And Susan Atkins, also 21, a former Girl Scout. While Manson stays at home, they are driven to an address he's had in mind for some time. 10,050 Cielo Drive. August 9th, 1969, Los Angeles awakes to news of a brutal murder spree. Friday night in Los Angeles, a movie actress and four of her friends were murdered. Identification of the persons are as follows. Sharon Polanski, Jay Sebring, Abigail Folger. Jay Sebring was an internationally famous hairstylist Abigail Folger was the heiress for the Folger Coffee fortune. Wojtek Verkowski was good friends with Roman Polanski. Stephen Parent had just been there to visit the caretaker. The victim suffered 102 stab wounds. Three of the victims were shot. One of the victims was pounded on his head with a gun butt. But we cannot tell you now. Sharon Tate was hung from a high beam going across the living room ceiling. On the front door, in blood, the word pig. The revolution is waiting for a spark. Everybody's ready. Everybody's got their guns together. All right. This is beautiful. OK. They'll be able to. You have to have this thing to where it just slides right out with your own motion. Everybody's waiting for somebody to have enough love to start it. Not content with one bloodbath, on the following night, Manson decides the killing spree must continue and sends cult members out to kill again. The family drove around Los Angeles County for four and a half hours looking at random for people to murder. Then Manson started giving more specific uh, directions. 
and they ended up at the La Bianca house at 3301 Waverly Drive. The latest murders were discovered during the night. Lino LaBianca, a supermarket owner, and his wife had both been stabbed to death, repeated stab wounds. Did you know the next night they were going out to the LaBiancas? No. Why the LaBiancas? There aren't any wise. Mm -mm. No wise at all. Manson's followers seem convinced the murderers didn't need justification for their actions. Would it be right? Under what conditions would it be right? If we did it, we did it. There's no why. But despite what the cult members say, there is a why. In the La Bianca house, above the inside of the front door is written the word rise. On the living room wall in Lino La Bianca's blood is written death to pigs. And on the refrigerator at the La Bianca's in Lino La Bianca's blood is written the words helter skelter. The double murder spree sends shockwaves through Hollywood. It was just pandemonium in Los Angeles, especially. People were so scared that gun sales uh, went up tremendously. But back at Spahn's ranch, the mood could not be more different. Tex tells me, I did this. Charlie told me to. They were almost like boastful or gleeful. I mean, it's like they, they didn't seem to have any remorse. Catherine Cher, known in the family as Gypsy, was interviewed in the Lost Tapes shortly after the murders. Are you pregnant, Gypsy? Mm hmm Did you ever think of uh, Sharon Tate's baby? Did I ever think of her baby? I've pictured her pregnant. Yeah. The baby? No, I've only, I've only pictured her pregnant. That's the, how, the only way I can picture her. I was so cut off that I couldn't feel what I should have felt for another pregnant woman and her child. And it's very disturbing to watch me put that out. The baby? No, I picture Sharon Tate pregnant at times. Yeah. Anybody watching this would think I was a monster. I didn't know her. I never met her. How can you tell what's in a picture? It's, it's, a, it's not even living. And there was part of me that still believed that he had all the answers and he was the one. There was another part of me that was starting to know better but I was keeping it just deep down inside because if I showed it, my life would be in danger. Meanwhile, the murder investigations are getting nowhere. Police don't even pick up the false clues that point towards a race attack. Undeterred, Manson moves his family to the desert to hide out from the race war he insists will be starting soon. But then things start to go wrong. Manson sets fire to a construction vehicle parked up on a desert site. Not a very swift move when you, when you want to hide. They poured gasoline on the tires and, and, and lit it. The sheriffs heard that there was a band of hippies up there. So they, they, they wanted to um, question the hippies. I was washing my hair, and I had a gun pointing at me. You're under arrest. So we got arrested for vandalizing government property. The Manson family are in jail, but they are getting away with murder. The police still have no idea they committed the Tate and the La Bianca killings. It wasn't until Susan Atkins got transferred to Los Angeles County Jail, Sybil Brand, that she started talking to her cellmate about Charlie and, you know, helter skelter. Susan Atkins, also known as Sadie, tells stories to her fellow prisoners that will be the turning point in the murder investigations. 
they're recorded in the lost tapes. Roll, 159. What is your name? My name is Ronnie Howard. She was telling me about different things that she thought would shock me, and I told her, nothing shocks me. And she said, well, I think I can tell you a few things that would shock you. One night, I guess she couldn't sleep. She came and she woke me up, and she sat down by my bed, and uh, she began to tell me about the Sharon Tate murders. She said, well, what if I told you that I was there, and I did it? And uh, I didn't believe her at first. Tell me what she said about Sharon Tate. And she told me, I asked her, then I said, well, if you were really there, I, I said, who really killed Sharon Tate? And she went on to tell me that she killed Sharon Tate. What happened with Sharon? What did Sharon do? Uh, she said that Sharon was crying, you know, and begging for her life. She told me that to stab somebody is better than having a climax. She said, uh, she says, uh, to stab somebody is a sexual release in itself anyway because everything in life is just, uh, the whole world is one big intercourse and everything in life is in and out, whether it's smoking, eating, stabbing, anything. And I told her, I said, Sadie, you know, if this is true, don't ever say another word. I said, they'll kill you for that. You know, they'll put you in the gas chamber if anyone was to find out. Ronnie Howard called LAPD and said, hey, this is what this w woman has told us, and that broke the case. On December 9th, 1969, the charge against Manson is changed from arson to first-degree murder. Manson will plead innocent. A band of members of a so-called religious cult with a leader they call Jesus has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. But one big question remains. The motive for the murder spree may have been helter-skelter, but why did they target Sharon Tate? Ronnie Howard is told the target was personal. Why did they pick the, the uh, Tate house? They knew that several people would be there that night, and they just knew whoever was in that house was going to die that night. Why did they have the it more, in for, the better. Why did they have it in for Roman Polanski? Well, it was the house, really. Manson had long held an ambition to succeed in music. What was he? When did you take up the guitar? When you, before you went into prison or after you got out? Or before, while you were in? While I was in. You took it up while you were in? Yeah. And you composed songs in prison? Play me one. greatest thing on earth, even though it sounded like a redigested, <laughs> you know, sometimes it was total confusion, sometimes it was beautiful. And the moments that it was beautiful would make me stay and say, ah, oh, there is something there. I'll never say never to always. I'll never say always to none. For a brief time in 1968, Manson and some of his family had lived with Beach Boy drummer Dennis Wilson. Wilson helped him make a contact that could change everything. I think that Dennis took him to a party at Terry Melcher's house, which, is on, which was at the time on Cielo Drive. Terry Melcher is one of the hottest rock and roll producers in America. He has it all a superstar mum in Doris Day, a superstar girlfriend in Candice Bergen, and at the time, he even rents a superstar's mansion in Beverly Hills. In Charlie's mind, Milcher was the connection to get the music out. Which he was. 
Yeah. But Melcher didn't think the music was good enough. Mm -mm. Any harbor resentment to Melcher for that? He didn't like it at all. <laughs> he didn't like it at all. Terry had really led him and us to believe that he was going to, you know, help him make a record. Terry had lied to him. And he talked about all these Hollywood people. They're all liars. Terry Melcher's house. They knew Terry Melcher no longer lived there in the house. Cielo Drive. But the house represented a symbol of rejection to Charlie. They're all liars. Liars. Everyone that left that ranch knew that they were out to slaughter some pigs that night. And anyone in that house on Cielo Drive was going to die that night, no matter who was there or how many. They were all going to die. They were all going to die. A wandering band of members of a so-called religious cult with a leader they called Jesus has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. Despite Manson and the family facing charges of murder, they protest their innocence, and many don't think he's guilty. I think he's a great person. Yes, and I love him dearly. I think he's darling. I don't think he did it. Uh, I think it was inspired by the devil. I think he's cool. New recruits are still joining the family. One of them, Aesop Aquarian, the young actor who got the Lost Tapes crew inside the ranch. I walked away from my house and everything that was in it. Just away. And uh, went to the ranch. The Lost Tapes show him playing the guitar with the family just days after the murder charge is filed. I was, quote, part of the family. I was living on the ranch, working the ranch. I was taking care of the girls. I was driving the girls. I was making sure they were safe. And the love that was there was undeniable. Anybody who, who came on the ranch, even for a second, you know, caught the love that we had. But between what the family felt and what others who lived alongside them felt, there is a huge gulf. One witness who saw Manson's family life up close is ranch hand at Spahn Ranch, Wendy Buckley. Manson had a bunch of ragtag, dirty little girls living down there with him. Most of them looked like they were children maybe 15, 16 year old kids. Looked like they were strung out totally on drugs. They were dirty. To me, it was beautiful. I didn't see the dust. I mean, housewives, everything, yard, trash everywhere. I just saw the quaintness of it. It was just filth everywhere and it just looked almost dreamlike to me. Bunch of trashy people looking for trouble. <laughs> the court asked me if I hated him. I said, no, I despise him with every bit of my being. I despise him. He ruins people's lives on purpose. He's vicious predator of teenagers. And he, they talk, oh, he loves us. He loves us. He didn't love anybody but himself. These girls loved Charlie so much that they literally would do anything for him. Literally would do anything for him. What does a mother lion do when someone comes to their cub? Whenever we need to, we do. We respond. We respond with our knives. We respond with whatever we have. Mm -hmm. 
among Manson's most loyal disciples on the outside are Nancy Pittman, known as Brenda, Lynette Frome, known as Squeaky, and Sandra Good, called Sandy. We could respond so quickly. Teeth, <laughs> anything, whatever, whatever is at hand. It's, we are animals. We are. You are part and parcel of. And I know that if they ever laid a finger on Charlie, if we were unarmed, we would chew their necks off. Anything, claw their eyes out. And they know it. I'm ready to die for Charlie. He's ready to die for me. He has died for me. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die for, to protect my own. The Manson trial begins on July 24th, 1970. I'm waiting for my man. $26 in my hand. Uh, it's, a, it's all a play, isn't it? I have no uh, absolute knowledge, but I don't think any case in history has received this much pre-trial publicity throughout the world. I blame Charles Manson for that. Stephen Kay was a rookie prosecutor working on the case. At age 27, I had been assigned to be a prosecutor on what was then considered the crime of the century. Kay's job will be tough. Manson left no fingerprints at the locations. There was nothing at the scene of the crimes to tie Manson in, into the crime, so it was all testimony. Do you want Mr. Canary to challenge the jurors, or are you ready to accept anyone that's put into the box? No, that's right. You've already tried. Okay. Just a minute. Just a minute. To bring Manson down, the prosecution needs someone on the inside. But turning a family member will be no easy task. In the visiting room, he said to a family member, if Gypsy tries to get away, I want you to tie her behind a car and drag her slowly back to the ranch. Don't kill her, but you can get close. And then he looked at me and said, are you going anywhere? And I said, no. Another potential witness is Diane Lake, now 16. Still under Manson's control, she has kept her true identity hidden until now. They sent us to testify in front of the grand jury. And that's when I finally felt safe enough to say, my name is Diane Lake. I'm 16 and I want my mommy. They committed me to 90 days observation at Patton State Hospital. And then the 90 days turned into nine months. It was like he was in my head telling me, turn left, turn right, you know, turn the light off. Don't say that or don't, don't talk to that person. Sandy, Brenda, Squeaky, four, take one. As Lake considers on. whether to testify against Manson, the tapes reveal what her former friends think of her. She's a very young girl, and by the time the, the DAs had gotten through with her, she was speaking their language. She's just like a baby. She can be molded whatever way anyone chooses to mold her. I'm sure that's what they believed, you know, that I had been swallowed up, you know, that, that I was being manipulated by the courts. The big question is, will Lake be brave enough to take the stand? Snitches will be taken care of. Oh. Ah, oh, that's to be seen. That's to be seen. Charles Manson. He and three female members of his communal family have for six months walked to the same courtroom in the Los Angeles Hall of Justice. The 154 volumes of transcript bear evidence of what may be the most surprising, unusual, and difficult trial in years. Over the course of the 10-month trial of Manson and his associates, mountains of evidence is presented. Teenage cult member Diane Lake might be key to convicting him, 
if she can escape his control. A unique moment from the lost tapes shows how hard that's going to be. Secretly, the filmmaker smuggles a camera into Manson's jail cell. And the cult leader takes his chance to speak directly to his followers. We are sneaking in the county jail, looking under the door to see if the man is there. Sneaking like little children out of town. <laughs> Sneaking, <laughs> sneaking all around the courthouse. He's programming yeah, us, uh, telling us what to do. Everywhere. Everything is sneaky up around Sneakyville. <laughs> Just telling us to break him out of jail, to learn where the vents are, learn how to get in and out of the building, and learn how to set him free. You got to sneak to get to the truth. The truth is condemned. The truth is in the gas chamber. Everyone who watches is struck by how loyal many of the family remain to Manson, both in jail and outside. Manson had a very powerful personality. When he was in a room, you could almost feel the electricity pouring off of him. He would kind of command the room. Truth has not been in your courtroom never has been in your courtroom. All you have is confusion in your courtroom. Nansen uh, one time uh, came into court and he had taken a razor blade and he put an X on his forehead. And the next day, the girls all had X's on their forehead. They said they were gonna X themselves out of society. In one bizarre demonstration of devotion, Manson family shave their heads and weave their hair onto an elaborate waistcoat they plan to give Manson on his release. Then Aesop Aquarian, the cult's newest member, claims he is given an extraordinary mission. One of the girls came up to me and said, we've got to get Charlie out. We, we want you to... Uh, to go to the uh, courthouse and uh, kill the judge. I felt my jaw drop to the ground. You want me to what? So we want you to kill the judge. That, that'll show him that we're serious and that'll get Charlie out. Are, are you for real? And uh, she said, yeah. My first thought was, what the hell am I doing here? Look at the madness that goes on. You can't prove anything that happened yesterday. Now is the only thing that's real. Despite Manson's hold over his family, some testify against him. One is Paul Watkins. Another is Diane Lake. It was terrifying. I was always afraid that I was going to have mind control by Charlie again. That was a big fear. And also that fear of wanting, you know, that original feeling of love and adoration from him. I, I thought that was going to be a weakness. Sandy, Brenda, Squeaky, four, take one, roll 209. The girls on the outside make it clear what they think of their former friend going against them. This makes a hole. She's open home. She's she wants attention. Diane Lake is called into court to testify against Manson. So I went in and then one of the first things, you know, they asked me is, did I love Charles Manson? And I said, I, I guess so. And then Charlie piped in, don't put it all on Mr. Manson. She loved everybody. And somehow just that, you know, my being able to tell the truth 
and his response kind of broke the spell. It's like he was just this little con, you know, talking his nonsense. The trial has lasted 10 months and is, at the time, the most expensive in US criminal history. The jury considers its verdict for 10 days. At the heart of their deliberations is an overriding question. Even though Manson did not personally murder anyone in the Tate or the LaBianca houses, is he ultimately responsible? I didn't want to believe the things I saw. But what can you do? I didn't want to believe the things I heard. But what can you do? I know what you can do. You can, uh, any way you can say it, and to as many people as you can say it to, you can just tell them, you can say, wake up. Wake up and look around and see the, the way things really are. The jury hearing the charges against Charles Manson and three girl members of his so-called family brought in its verdict this afternoon. All were found guilty of murder in the first degree. Manson then shouted at the jurors, you're all guilty. On April the 19th, 1971, Manson is sentenced to die for the murder spree that shocked the world. Leslie Van Houten, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel and Charles Tex Watson will also be given the death sentence. They seem unfazed. For a long time, many of Manson's followers remained devoted to their messiah. Again and again and again, I've got to pay for your sins. I've been laying up here paying for your sins for 2,000 years. When you believe in someone, uh, then you believe in them. Others manage to break free. Do I feel that Charlie Manson conned me? As time went on, absolutely. Charlie had learned to be a very good manipulator. How do you feel about Charles Manson? <laughs> <laughs> I think the dangerous side of Charlie was that he would do anything to survive. He didn't have any, anything he wouldn't do to survive. I'm so thankful I, I didn't get pregnant, I didn't get addicted to drugs, you know, I didn't kill myself, and, and I didn't kill anybody. In 1972, Charles Manson and his accomplices have their death sentences commuted to life in prison. Others will also go to prison for Manson-linked killings. I was sent to prison when I was 21 years old. I am now almost 71. So I've been in prison for 50 years, give or take. It's hard to even fathom that. I, I, I shattered my soul. What was Manson really thinking? Over the years, many motives have been ascribed to him. Race war. Symbolic revenge. That they were out to slaughter some pigs that night. Self-preservation. Issued us all buck knives. Bobby Beausoleil, who met with Manson while awaiting trial for the murder of Gary Hinman, thinks they are all wrong. I met up with Charlie in the holding tank at the Hall of Justice. It was just, you know, happenstance, just a, it was a fluke. You know, I asked him straight out, how did things go so crazy, so out of control? And he seemed almost embarrassed. He said, I sent text to kill Terry, meaning Terry Melcher, uh, the producer for the Beach Boys. They didn't know Terry had left. So imagine Charlie's shock. Instead of, you know, taking care of his grudge with Terry, now he's got a much larger problem on his hands with a movie star 
you know, house full of five people, this bizarre, high-profile crime, uh, and he must have gone over the deep end at that point. Charlie was not a master. He had no plan at all for anything. Charlie wanted what has happened to him. You're right. Charlie's done everything he could to get put back in jail. What did he say about jail? He said jail was like his home because he'd spent so much time there, 20 years. He used to tell us stories about sitting and listening to the other guys in the joint, and he never had a story to tell them. Now I guess he would have a hell of a story to tell them. Story to tell me.